Marilyn Waring, uh, I often hear about you uh, every single time that I am introduced at an event as the youngest person in New Zealand's parliament since you, 42 I'm years ago. I'm very sorry, I apologise. <laughs> Yeah, no one should have to wear that, you know. Well, there's a lot. Funnily enough, that's kind of often where the contrast ends. Um, it's just that 42 years ago, you were my age when you entered Parliament. How were you received by the local constituents as a woman putting herself forward to be elected? There was this wonderful pass the parcel mm -hmm. sort of thing. It was a big rural electorate. And I make no secret of the fact I'm terrifically book learned, but frankly, in terms of life, I know bugger all, really. <laughs> Um, and and so they go to teach me. Yep. So I start right up in the north, way beyond Whangapai, and and you know week by week or over periods of days, work your way down. I work my way down through Te Akau, Rua Kiwi, Huntley, Rotawara, you know Raglan, etc. You just keep going all the way. I learned plenty. Yeah. I had some extraordinary adventures. It was a night in Te Akau when I went to bed after a big. Uh, meeting in the local hall and as I went to sleep I could hear them arguing, the husband and wife, and a couple of hours later I was bolt upright in my bed because a gun went off in the room next door. And I sat bolt upright and thought, shit, he's shot her, you see. And then after a little while I could hear them both talking and some sort of animal screamy noise. But no one said a word and in the morning when I went to breakfast they said, oh I hope it didn't disturb you too much in the Evening, Marilyn. So possum came down the chimney. <laughs> so. so real life. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Real yeah. Raglan. Going from having no campaigning experience to all of a sudden being on the road and you know being out there talking to people and essentially trying to sell yourself, it was a really weird experience for me. What was the transition like for you? As far as, I mean, just to, just to flesh it out, my experience, right, um, and we were both around the same age, was when you, and this is the um, kind of anecdote that I use frequently, when you're a kid and you look up at adults, you think that they have a clue and know the meaning of life and you know, then you grow up and realise nobody knows what the hell is going on. It was the same for me becoming a politician. You just realise people are better at fronting up with a facade. <laughs> so, you know, connecting with people and trying to speak to large crowds of people was quite a bizarre experience going from zero to that position. I asked lots of questions yep. of people all the time. So they were telling me about Raglan. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'd hear something here and I could use it two nights later. Yeah. Right, so so I was using the material people gave me, mm -hmm. stories they told me. I loved learning from mm. stories because I could remember them yeah. really well. Um, and I mostly, I was a candidate for a party with a policy, mm. which is really different from what you went through, mm. Chloe. So. Um, probably there were questions coming sometimes when you, you know, thought, my God, I've never thought of that before. <laughs> you know? There's that too. But then I yeah. think as well, going into the um, position when I did sign up to the Greens um, and, you know, not just being a young woman, but also being from a smaller party and having to justify yourself consistently in the space. It, it always made me reflect on how so many people before me, um, whether they were from the Greens or whether they were women or younger women in Parliament, had been fighting for validity and justification for people like myself to exist in that space. Mm. So uh, that's one of the big questions that I've got for you. I mean, you've got the picture here um, on the front of the book. The photo there is taken at the first meeting of the government caucus after the 1978 general election. So I'm the only woman in that caucus for the next three years. In fact, from 1975 to 1981, I'm the only woman MP in the North Island. So how were you received by your caucus colleagues? I didn't spend time with many of my colleagues. A lot of boys elbowing each other for room and sound space and all of that kind of thing. Not a greatly cerebral activity. I didn't endear myself to them in the caucus situation. Why is that? Because you had an opinion? Or? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Um, and generally they didn't share it. Something like, what is it, two thirds of the first cabinet yep. had all served in the Second World War. Mm. Everybody was governing for yesterday. Mm. These guys just had no idea about what the world was about. Dear George Gere used to say to me, 
dear, you were just always so far ahead of us. And I used to say to him, George, I was just current. So it was like, yeah, I was totally a different gender, totally a different era. Yeah. There weren't all that many people in the caucus with degrees. Yeah. Um, it, you, people didn't like evidence very much. I can tell you, you know? that that still exists. Yeah. Is that still yeah. the case? Oh, yeah. I mean, we've, there's more degrees now um, in, per head of parliament, but yeah, there's definitely evidence is anathema to politics. So. Yeah, and there's also then, you know, you add in the ingredients of hyperpartisanship in a soundbite media environment, which is becoming uh, ever more difficult in an overly saturated media environment where everybody's competing for space and we have social media. Yeah, I think that's really true. That that's like in the past, and when I was in Parliament, mm. I could give a speech and I could expect, well, six to eight paragraphs totally to be published as part of the speech. Yeah, look, you know. Published where? In newspapers. Yeah, truly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a speech published yeah. in the... Yes, so sometimes in some newspapers, the whole speech, if I was controversial enough. So I didn't have to contend with soundbite cliches like you do. That's, I didn't have I to contend with the madness <laughs> of, of, you know, trying to work out what sensational 15 seconds yeah. can I put together for even to be heard? Yeah. You see, what you've got. I never had to compare with that. Well, that's, that's that. my big challenge, right? Because I end up being bridged on the way into the house and I end up being asked a question about something controversial, whether it's drug law reform or mental health or education or whatever. And uh, my immediate response is to go through, here's the history of this issue and here's where I stand and here's the rationale and logic as to why that is. And frequently my, my sound bites are never used because they're not sound bites. <laughs> they're far too waffly. Yeah. So, well, and also, of course, because the, the speed has become the name of the game, yeah. there's no investigative journalism anymore mm. either. Well, there was in mm. my day. I have kind of come to the conclusion that I'm not really interested in just being in Parliament for the sake of being in Parliament. But I do think looking at um, colleagues and looking at how the the structure of the place indoctrinates you, the incentive structure is entirely perverse. You know, people mm. do absolutely come in believing something, but when you're faced with the opportunity to create transformative change on the one hand, which is often complicated and nuanced, and you have to explain it, uh, versus keeping your head down and thinking that you can just continue to tweak around the edges and do the incrementalism, people will opt for that one because they know that, you know, that is the pathway that to date has secured them a continuing position in power. Hmm. So But you know, you so have a whole life. <laughs> oh no, I know life. I do. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it is and it's very, very difficult to to conjure yeah. with other people just playing safe. Yeah. All the time. You know. It's a bit like the climate catastrophe. Mm. Right, and mm. who's prepared to really front up oh, to how dreadful it is, mm. you know, and and what has to be done yesterday, mm. Mm. Um, and and there's quite a bit of tiptoeing around mm. all of that oh, that definitely. I can see. I mean, and there's mm. the the reality of, as you say, evidence-based politics, and then actually the politics side of it and communicating it not just to the general public uh, so that you create an environment that's conducive to putting pressure on the politicians who disagree for sake of disagreeing uh, but also bringing the other politicians onto your team so you can just get stuff done. Um, one of the most frustrating things to me is operating in such an inherently colonial adversarial environment where people are only concerned about winning or being right. Yeah. It's, it's, there's no real concern palpably that I can feel um, on a day-to-day -day basis to do the right thing. But Chloe, this is also about, it's really interesting because this is something that really came to me in the book. Mm. It's really unhealthy to have to get up every morning to go to work to fight. Yeah. It's really unhealthy for everybody. You know, that whole atmosphere of, of that pervading. Yeah, so how did you survive? Well, I'm not sure you have to finish the book and find out if you really <laughs> think I did. And I think people have to understand that it doesn't matter which party we're in, there are some bottom lines, mm. you know, that are bigger than me or the party yep. or anything else. It's oh, just definitely. too bad. Definitely. Yeah. 
Yeah, but I mean, it, it's also about finding that balance where, and this has been a real challenge for me, where there's only so much, particularly when you are in the swing of it. I mean, you can totally write a book about it 40 years after the fact, yeah. but when you're in the swing of it, finding that balance of honesty uh, versus maintaining confidentiality of, you know, obviously discussions that you're having behind the scenes and having people be certain and feel safe and secure in your integrity, you know, whilst you're kind of walking that line mm. and fighting those battles and putting out those fires behind the scenes, whilst also sharing as much as you possibly can, but not quite everything. I think it's really hard. Mm. Um, uh, I, I, and, and I've watched you over, mm. you know, some of these issues. Mm. And, the, and the public expectation that you'll just somehow or other behave in a way that assists their anger. Yeah. Right. Without understanding what's going on. I watched um, Mike Minogue being subject to all kinds of slurs, mm. you know, because he didn't behave this way on the yeah. Official Secrets Act or he didn't behave this way on the security intelligence legislation. But all the time he was mining the obligation mm. from Muldoon that there would be freedom of information, mm. right? But he had to wear the outside, you know, sell out, don't live up to your own principles, mm. all that kind of stuff. And when, you know, it's just fine if you're a, a loud trot, you can just <laughs> pop off and make all the noise you like, but it doesn't really serve, mm. uh, you know, what constructive, contribution you're yeah. trying to make that they can never see mm. and the trade-offs you're making not just for 2019 mm. but for some time later. Mm. If you could have one last conversation with Muldoon, huh. <laughs> what would you say? I, I really don't know that I'd have anything to say to him. I had very little to say to him in the eight and a half years I had to work with him so Nothing much at all. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, oh, well, I wouldn't waste my breath. <laughs> Still rolling. <though. laughs> yeah. um,